as you know, I always say buckle your seat belts. It's great to have you here. Great to have you with us right now online. I'm Gary Cassie, and we're going to jump into our session here this afternoon, and I trust it'll help you a lot. But anyway, I got a phrase I want to get, let you know. First off, taking territory is what we're all about, and just add a hashtag there, a little dot with God. Taking territory with God. That's how it gets done. And I want to give you this phrase you may not have thought about, God needs money. I know you, people think, you know, I need God's money, right? I need God to help me with my money. He wants to, but I only understand God needs money. Did you know that? God needs money. He's in a major rescue effort right now. He sent Jesus into the earth for you, and it takes a lot of money to, to accomplish that. You know, you're seeing us over uh, TV. We, we spend millions a year for TV. We're in a building that costs us millions. You probably drive to work in a car that costs out. I mean, everything costs money. And so we're going to talk about that today. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, good. I don't know how many years ago it's been, but we were going out to dinner and a waitress was very pregnant. You could tell she was due very soon. And I just felt led to give her a very, a large tip, a large tip. And she didn't look at it. She went back in the kitchen, you know, wherever they got this you know, tea and coffee and things. She came back out with tears literally shaking and began to thank us for this tip and began to open up to us her life. Now, we did not say anything to her. She opened up her life, the problems she was having and the need she had in her life and, you know, the, the problems she's having financially. And we got to share Christ with her and we got to pray with her. We did not even mention a scripture. We just gave her a tip. And I want to talk to you about being generous. I want to talk to you about generosity and how it opens the heart of people and the goodness of God. You know, my dad never said once that I can ever remember that he loved me growing up. It was not until I was 27 years old when I was graduating from college that my mother insisted that my dad tell me that he loved me. He couldn't do it. My mother is saying, you know, you mean you can't even tell your, your own son that you love him? My dad, he wouldn't say it. Finally, in desperation, my mom in tears, my dad finally said that he loved me. Now, I didn't count that one. <laughs> I was good to hear it, but I didn't count it. You know, I just, you know, I didn't count it. But after we were married, we had some bills we couldn't pay. We had an IRS bill I couldn't pay, and I was nervous about it. You know, we were newly married. I didn't understand business really and taxes. And I owed $4,000 to the IRS. At that time, that was a ton of money. Just, I didn't have it. At that time, we were going home to visit Ohio, visit my parents, and my dad asked how I was doing, and I mentioned the IRS bill. And my dad very casually said, oh, that's not a problem. He pulled out his checkbook and wrote a check out for $4,000 and handed it to me. And he says, as long as I have it, you know, I'm willing to help. That took me so off guard. I remember that day that in tears, I realized my dad loved me. You know, my dad never expressed his love with words, but he would occasionally, you could see glimpses of his heart. And when he wrote that check out, that generosity, I saw my dad's heart. Generosity lets you see the person's heart. It opens people up. I saw my dad's heart. Romans chapter two, verse four says this, or do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended, pay attention to that, is intended to lead you to repentance. Now, now think about what God's saying. His goodness is to lead you. It's, it's intentional. His goodness is intentional to reveal God's heart. Like my dad on that day, he couldn't tell me he loved me, but he was generous and I saw my dad's heart. In fact, that day I felt a love for my father. You know, I, his generosity touched my heart and made me have a greater love for him. And so being generous, write this down, being generous is acting like God does. 
Being generous is acting like God does. Now, I'm teaching out of my brand new book today. It's the fifth in the series of the Financial Revolution series, which I believe uh, has gone around the world. Uh, so it's, it's available right now. If you like a copy, I want to just let you know. We're re- I'm releasing it as we speak right now, my fifth book. But uh, anyway, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Now, an ambassador, you probably know what an ambassador is. Definition of an ambassador is a diplomatic official of the highest rank appointed, accredited as representative by one government to another sovereign government. An authorized messenger or representative. Now, we are representing the kingdom of God. We are ambassadors in this earth realm. And as so, we should act as God does. We need to be generous. We need to represent his heart towards people. When people think of you, they should think of a generous person. They should think of people being, of of you being generous. Unfortunately, a lot of people can't be generous. 57% of people don't have $1,000 in the bank, 57%. 44% cannot pay $400 a month, uh, $400 uh, just cash. 23% of Americans are not even paying their monthly expenses or falling further and further in debt every month. America is in trouble financially. You know, there are traps and schemes to take your money. 1.2 billion active credit cards in the U.S. 7 to 8 billion credit card offers mailed out every year. Someone wants you in debt. Someone doesn't want you free. Someone doesn't want you to be generous and free to serve God. You know, it's not just the banks and retailers that are setting, setting schemes up to capture your money. Satan also knows that if you had money, you'd be effective. And he also knows you might reach your destiny and have an impact in his kingdom. You know, we have a story in Luke chapter 5, which I've taught out so many times, of Peter, James, and John fishing all night, catching nothing. Luke chapter 5, verse 5, they caught nothing all night. Jesus borrows Peter's boat, goes out and fishes. Jesus, using the boat, preaches from the shore and then tells Peter to let down the nets. Verse 5, Peter says, Master, we've worked hard all night, haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they'd done so, they caught such a large number of fish, their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full, they began to sink. Now, when Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the son of Zebedee, their partners. Then G- Jesus said this to, to Peter, who's Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll fish for people. So they pulled their boats up, left everything, and followed Jesus. Now, I would suggest this to you today. Obviously, Jesus caught their attention with this catch of fish, but I would suggest to you today, this whole story is not really about the fish. This story is about the people. You see, once provision was taken care of, once Peter saw that the kingdom operated at a level that was so beyond his understanding and provided such a catch of fish, Jesus said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I see more fish than I've ever seen before. I don't have to be afraid. You follow me? He's a fisherman. It's his livelihood. Jesus is going to give him a commandment, but not without evidence. He says, he didn't say come and follow me instantly. Let's go change gears. Let's go catch fish. He said, here's the fish. More than you've ever seen caught. You're going to catch people. The story is really not about fish. It's really about God's heart for people. It's really about God's intentional pursuit of people, of his love for people, his love to rejoin and capture what was lost at the garden, to bring people back into his kingdom, to bring people back in line with their created purpose and not running after money and not running after 
false illusions of what purpose really is. No, Peter, let me show you what life really is. We're going after people. God, as I've said many times, God's in the people business. He is in the people business. You quoted 2 Corinthians 9, so let's dig into our word. Let's dig into this because we all have to pass the test. You have to pass the test. And we, my, I, I really feel the Holy Spirit's, uh, if I can convey, I want to convey God's heart in this conference for people. And we have the opportunity to be involved in that process. Chapter 9, verse 10, we, we quote this. Everyone in this room can probably quote it. You can probably quote it. We've all heard it, but I don't want you to think about what it's saying. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. I think that's God's intent, don't you? God wants to enlarge not just your wealth. He wants to enlarge the impact you'll have in his people business. That's the real thing behind it. You'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God because of this service by which you have proven yourselves God spoke to you again. You've proven yourself. You're going to the next level. Others will praise God for this obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity and sharing with them and with everyone else and in their prayers for you. Their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. So again, generosity opens the heart of people and it shows them God's heart. Generosity supersedes words. You probably remember when someone was very generous to you or a compliment was given to you because you remember those days, those events. Now here's the, ma here's the major key. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing, what? Sur uh, the surpassing grace. God has given you. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. What's the gift? Well, we'll find out. Surpassing means a large amount or high degree, exceeding, excelling, or extraordinary, or structures of surpassing magnificence. So what is going to be yours in a huge amount? What does it say? Grace, right? Because of the surpassing grace God has given you, their generosity, being able to be generous on every occasion, those that receive generosity are going to thank God for you and this surpassing grace that God has given you. So again, surpassing grace means extraordinary, magnificent, exceeding. So what is grace? The traditional definition of grace is unmerited favor. I think that falls way short. Grace is the empowering presence of God, enabling you to be who he created you to be and to do what he has called you to do. It is the power of God. So what is he saying? He is saying this surpassing power of God that has enabled you to prosper is a gift. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Gift of what? Of the surpassing grace, the power of God to prosper. Now, if God is going surpassingly above your, your ability, I'd say that's a pretty good team. Are you following me? See, you're working together. His heart is to reach the people. You have an option to be involved or not. And he says, if you get involved, there is my grace, my power goes to work to help you bring in the money that is needed in my people business. You got it? This is why Paul's letters always start with grace and peace to you. God's power to you, his peace to you. 
Almost all of his epistles start that way. Now I'm going to show you what I believe is the greatest wealth building secret in life. You will be made rich in every way. This is what God says. You will be made rich. Not that you'll strive to become rich. You will be made rich in every way. And it goes beyond money. That's life. So that you can be generous on every occasion. You've got to have some cash sitting around to be generous two or three times a day. And so through your generosity, this is a result in thanksgiving to God. I'm going to go through a couple parables with you that I want to emphasize how often and how much Jesus talked about your prosperity and why. And there are actually many parables, if you look at the Bible, that are given to us to understand this mission that God is on. Matthew 25, the parable of the talents is one we've talked about many times. Starting in verse 14 of Matthew 25, again, the kingdom of God is like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one bag, each according to his ability. So he goes on his journey. The man who received five bags of gold multiplied it to five more or ten, right? The one that had the two bags now has four. The guy that had the one bag, what did he do with it? He buried it. Verse 24. Then the man who had received the one bag, now remember the master comes back and now brings accountability to this, you know, how these guys do with his wealth. He says, okay, what'd you do? And this guy says, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what's belonged to you. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. It means you're not worth too much. You're not helping the cause too much, right? So you knew that I harvest where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it with interest. Why'd the guy bury it? His view of God was totally warped as God is a hard taskmaster. Religion has taught us that God's a hard taskmaster, that all he wants, we just serve, 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 right? That God, you know, just God, you know, just got to serve God. We're forced to, it's a, it's a duty. It's just, we got to serve God. And that was his attitude. So because the master is not going to plant the seed, it's not going to harvest the seed, yet take the seed, take the, take the harvest. This servant felt like, why even bother getting involved? There's nothing in it for me, right? I'm not getting, this guy, it's, it's all about him. It's all about him. You know, it's like, you know, I'm, I, why should I get involved? So he buried it. Now the master called his bluff because he said, here's what belongs to you. Like I'm trying to protect it. The master called his bluff because he was trying to give the image that he cared about the master's affairs. The point is he could care less about the master's affairs. And let's go on here. Verse 28 is the point I want to make. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to someone else. That's what it says. Take it from him and give it to the one that has 10 bags of gold. Not politically correct, but it's very correct. If you're in business, give it to the one that knows what to do with it. For whoever has will be given more and they'll have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and what done with it, given to someone else. And throw that worthless servant outside. So friend, his view of the master was wrong because if you study the, this parable, the master said to those first two, the one that actually went to work with his money on his behalf, he said, come and enjoy your master's happiness. They got to share in the harvest. The, the, they got to share in the goodness of what they did. But friend, this is the opportunity God's given us. What is important to God wasn't the fish, 
It was the people. God is in the people business. Who's going to get the ideas? Who's going to get the multi-million dollar contract? Who's going to get the, the real estate sales? Who's going to get, who is God going to send those divine appointments to? The one that has his interest at heart. In my book, I talk about one word that you should remember. In fact, I, I say, if you don't get anything out of my book, I want you to write this word down. And we've talked about it many times here at Faith Life Church. But again, I want to put it in context. What we're saying today is the word sent, right? In Luke chapter 4, I'd love to teach this because it's, I tell you, as I teach these two sessions, they do grip, they do grip, they do speak. And uh, my, my prayer is that they'll speak to you. He says, um, Jesus coming out of the baptism at the River Jordan, goes into his hometown of Nazareth, goes into the synagogue there, grabs the scroll of Isaiah and reads there. They're all amazed. But then he says to them in verse 24, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Why? Because too familiar, it's familiarity. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to, Zer uh, to, to a widow in Zarephath. Zarephath was a Canaanite town. It was not even part of Israel. What is Jesus doing? He is basically condemning their heart for God. They, because in the story, he was basically saying there's no one in Israel that would have done what this widow does. You know, we always look for and hope for a lot of people look for that multi-million dollar idea. Oh, if I could have just bought this stock at this price back in history, if I would have known what I, you know, if I could have known then, you know, if I could just have that. Friend, you have it, it's right here. God has more ideas than you can ever use up. One night I had a dream. We were in the old warehouse back in this day and money was tight, you know, and we were just learning how the kingdom operated and applying it. You know, we learned it in our family life. Now the bills were bigger. We're, you know, money's tight in the warehouse days. I had a dream. In this dream, we were having a Christmas event at the warehouse. And so we had some shrubbery outside the, the door there. And I was outside uh, spray painting the shrubbery with that fake snow, you know, you put on the window. Those, you know, I had a spray can and I was spraying the the bushes out there. I wanted to make this, I wanted to make the party special, right? So I'm praying the, I mean, spraying the bushes, right? This man who I knew came up behind me in the dream and said, what are you doing? I said, well, I got a party going on. I'm, it's a Christmas party and I'm, I'm spraying the trees white. I want to make it look like snow's on them. And he goes, no, we got to, you got to do it right. I'll pay for it. And he had multiple dump trucks of real snow brought in and dumped at the front door around the trees. As I was standing there, as the snow was being piled up, these trucks dumped the snow there, and I was standing there with him, all of a sudden, up in the clouds, I saw it looked like a, a tornado forming, but it wasn't black, it was white. And it was spinning, and I, 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 I pointed to it. Out of the tornado, this man owned businesses. Out of the tornado, I saw his business come out of the tornado, and it was huge, and it came down to the earth beside him. After, of course, I met this guy, and this is the dream. I actually met him uh, in, by coincidence, by coincidence, several weeks later, and we talked about what we were doing, and he said, I'll pay for that. When he said, I'll pay for that, I felt I could tell him the dream. And today, his business is one of the largest in the United States in, in, the, in the areas that he works in. His business grew just like that dream. Why? Because he con was concerned about God's business, and he paid for it. In my book, I talk about one word that you should remember. In fact, I, I say, if you don't get anything out of my book... I want you to write this word down, and we've talked about it many times here at Faith Life Church, but again, I want to put it in context, what we're saying today is the word sent. In Luke chapter 4, he says, um, Jesus coming out of 
the baptism at the River Jordan, goes into his hometown of Nazareth, goes into the synagogue there, grabs the scroll of Isaiah and reads there. They're all amazed. But then he says to them in verse 24, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Why? Because too familiar, it's familiarity. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to, Zer- uh, to, to a widow in Zarephath. Zarephath was a Canaanite town. It was not even part of Israel. What is Jesus doing? He is basically condemning their heart for God. They, because in the story, he was basically saying there's no one in Israel that would have done what this widow does. In 1 Kings chapter 17, we find the story. You know the story of Elijah. There's a, there's a famine, there's a drought. The Holy Spirit says in verse 9 to go to Zarephath, stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he goes, when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and please bring me a piece of bread. She says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she says, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar, a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home, make a meal for myself and my son. That's it. We're out. And Elijah said to her, what? Don't be afraid. But he's going to give her the answer. But he's heading it up by, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. First, then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. There was food every day for Elijah and the woman and her family. Now, I think all of us who've been taught here know what happened. Why would the prophet ask her first to give him bread? Because you know spiritually when she voluntarily gave her her last meal, it changed jurisdiction. Her meal pot now came under the grace of God, the jurisdiction of the kingdom of heaven. And as that happened then, how much did it cost her to give that meal away? Zero. Because as we read, God gives seed to the sower and bread for the eating. You'll find this throughout the entire Bible, that there was food for God's assignment, his purpose, and for that family throughout the entire famine. But it's interesting that Elijah, the prophet, you know, a prophet carries the word of God. The prophet was sent. The Holy Spirit looked across the country, across the land, to find someone who would believe him enough to fund God's assignments. I am sure there were people that died of hunger in that time that could have had that blessing, could have had, but yet they would not receive it. You know, we always look for and hope for, a lot of people look for that multi-million dollar idea. Oh, if I could have just bought this stock at this price back in history, if I would have known what I, you know, if I could have known then, you know, if I could just have that, friend, you have it, it's right here. God has more ideas than you can ever use up. Joining his team is an amazing opportunity. You know, God has assignments here in the earth realm he wants to accomplish. It's all about people. Every assignment needs people. He calls people to his assignments and he calls money to his assignments. God is looking over the earth to find people who'd carry his assignments and fund his assignments. And there's reward with that. You know, one of my favorite scriptures, and again, another parable, is the Good Samaritan. And it's interesting, these parables are named names that are not accurately portraying what God is trying to tell people in these parables. You know, I grew up with a religious mindset and grew up in religious teaching, and no one ever explained the parables to me spiritually. They would just be nice stories that you read about someone doing a good, good, a good deed or something, right? But in Luke chapter 10, we find the story of, of this good Samaritan 
And again, I've taught this many times, but it fits into the context of what I believe the Lord is doing this weekend, as along with the same message God has told us to send out Kingdom Advance, send the ships out, these small groups across the nations to bring in God's harvest and teach the kingdom. I believe this time period right now, God's heart is to bring his kingdom into the earth in a new way and to touch people's lives, but he needs people to do it. Luke chapter 10 in verse number, uh, verse number 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law, Jesus said. How do you read it? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus said, do this and you'll live. But he wanted to justify himself. And who's my neighbor? So Jesus tells us this story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He, sent, uh, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring an oil and wine on it. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, as I've said many times, I've heard this story for years and years and years about being a good neighbor, you know, being a good neighbor. But in reality, there's much more to this story than that. And as we talk about this story, you know, the religious folks bypassed this guy because, well, Samaritans were unclean to the Jews and they wanted to make sure they stayed right with God. <laughs> follow what I'm saying. They want to stay right with God and not help this person. Jesus, of course, is correcting their, their fallacy, their wrong theology. And you'd have to agree that Jesus would do what this Samaritan does. He would care for the person, which the story says. But the interesting fact is Jesus goes to him, bandages his wounds with oil and wine, which is a, a prophetic look at what he would eventually do anyway through the blood covenant and the, the life of the Holy Spirit. But then he takes him to an inn and pulls out silver and says, take care of this guy and whatever it costs, I'll pay for it. Now, I want you to understand that and grab this sentence, whatever it costs, I'll pay for it. Whatever it costs, I'll pay for it. And that's God speaking. This is what God would do. Whatever it costs, I'll pay for it. How valuable are people to God? He loved the world so much that he sent Jesus to die for, for us, humanity. Everything, whatever it cost. Now, I always like to teach it this way. You know, religiously, duty, you owe it to God to take care of this guy. Hey, this guy needs help, right? But I don't want to teach Sunday school this week. I don't want to go to the kids' ministry. You know, but oh, I signed up to be a greeter this week. Oh, I, I guess I have to go. I guess it's my duty to go. Well, we appreciate that. <laughs> but you are sadly missing the entire point. So when someone's born again, they're damaged. The world, we all are damaged in the world. We apply the oil, the Holy Spirit, life, you know, the, the new life of God. But we're still carrying the wounds and still carrying the wrong perception of life. We need a place to heal and to learn what the kingdom's really like. God sets people in the local church under a pastor. Now, Jesus is a chief pastor, which means shepherd. But Jesus, according to Ephesians chapter 4, appoints shepherds to watch over his people and to help them on their journey. So God assigns these people that in the world, when they come to Christ, he assigns them under a shepherd, under a pastor, or in this story, we could say to an inn. He brings them to an inn. 
they're still damaged. This is why he says, you know, no matter what it costs, he has to heal. He can't travel yet. He's got to become whole again. But Jesus places him under the care of an innkeeper. Now, religion would say, hey, you owe it to God to give. It's a sacrificial offering. You ever heard that? It's a sacrificial offering. You owe it to God for what he's done to you, right? And so by duty, loyalty or whatever, we could willingly kind of follow up on our commitment. But we miss the whole point of the silver coins. God pays. And the innkeeper knew something that we need to understand. The innkeeper's in business to make money. So when he charges that daily rate, he's built in the cost of the maid servant, the meals. But he's also added on top of that what? You actually said that. Profit's a nasty word to say in church and profit. <laughs> What? You're going to charge us for books, Pastor Gary? The gospel's free. Well, the book wasn't. (laughs) So this innkeeper, now think about what I'm saying. This innkeeper does not look upon that as a distraction or an obligation of duty that he regrets being involved with, does he? He thinks it is the best the greatest news of his day. Because not only did the guy give him two silver coins, he said, whatever it cost. What is the innkeeper going to do? He's going to tell this guy, because the guy's leaving down the street. If you see some more guys like this down the street, (laughs) bring them to me. And if I don't have room, I'll add on. I'll buy more land. I'll build more buildings. Just keep them coming. Because he understands profit. It's crazy. Christians have been taught that God doesn't think that way. They think only in terms of duty. That God is not a rewarder. And you have to understand that when you get involved with God's projects, and you get involved with funding God's heart for people, Everything changes. Now this grace of God, God who make God himself, is now hooked up with you to help you prosper and fund his kingdom objective to rescue his people. To bring his people into the kingdom, out of Satan's dominion. You know, it's interesting that, I guess it's maybe going on a year and a half, two years ago, that we were looking for campus property. You've heard the story. We just couldn't find any uh, property or buildings in the area we felt God leading us to launch a campus available. We had several opportunities to pull the, you know, lever on a couple and sign the documents, but it just had a check. It just wasn't right. And so we went to this meeting where they were launching this TV network, and we had an opportunity. Say opportunity. We had an opportunity to sow into one of God's projects. Our choice. And as I sat there, God spoke to me and said, again, God doesn't demand. He always gives you direction. Basically, you know, this is what I would suggest. (laughs) But to sow $100,000 into that television network. And when you do so, he said, I want you to take this to your church and tell them what you're doing. I want you to believe God for that property to show up, and I want you to tell Satan to take his hands off your business. So we did that in every service. We told Satan, get your hands off God's business. We, we can't, we're, no, we feel led to open a campus. We know we wouldn't feel led to, to put a campus over there if there wasn't something available over there. Satan's interfering. We, we command that to stop, and we're going to believe God, you're going to show us. We're sowing this in faith. That was on a Thursday. That weekend, we took that $100,000 check to each service. Each service of all four services, we prayed over that, laid our hands on it, and released it on Monday. On Tuesday, we had a dinner set up with one of our partners that we'd had set four or five times throughout the year. But each time, we had to move it. 
but this time it held. So we sat down with our partner and, you know, it was great to talk to them again and began to talk about church. And they asked, how's the building project? And I said, well, we have, we have some issues with that. Cities change rules, There's just issues popped up, changes in zoning, different things happened that around us that it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen soon. And he said, you know, you need to be looking for a campus. I said, we are. We are. We've been trying to, we've been looking for six months or more. We've been looking, but there's just nothing there. But that day in the morning, I think it was our daughter or someone, I think Amy may have emailed us or texted us and said, hey, we saw this uh, school that it was for sale. We thought it was pretty awesome, but, you know, it's pretty expensive. And she said, you know, yeah, look at it. So we came home on Tuesday morning before we had dinner with this partner, we agreed to go see this piece of property. And it was amazing. I mean, it was a, high, it was a whole uh, high-end high school campus complex, not just a building. You know, it had a three-story high school, you know, arts building, buildings, uh, all kinds of, had a house with it. I mean, all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, four tennis courts, running tracks. I mean, think of a high school, weight room. I mean, it just, it was perfect, 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 because our hearts for kids, we want to reach kids and educate kids and reach that community. So it was perfect, except, as you know, what? It, it was perfect, except what? Money. Money. Millions. So we had dinner with that partner. Well, we did see something today that looked great. I mean, it's, you know, yeah, we, we did finally find a property in that area that was perfect, you know. But, God, it's, it's millions. We're sitting there, and he turns to Drenda and said, well, what if it was free? Drenda didn't act like she didn't hear him. I heard him, but I was like, did I hear that? He said to Drenda, Drenda, what if it was free? She, what do you mean? He said, what if it was free? He said, what if we just wrote the check out? Oh, uh, we could handle that. <laughs> And they did. Now, the story I'm telling, obviously, I think most of us know that, but you don't know what happened to them. You need to know what happened to them. So during this time period, the same time period, they were in the process of negotiating, purchasing another business. The franchise owner of that other business declined their offer and said they've already had someone else that was purchasing it. But this partner said he didn't feel released in his spirit. He felt, nah, that's not right. I just believe that's my, my, I believe that's my franchise. And after they sowed that money, it may have been not long, maybe a week or two or after they, 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 did, you know, they did that, they got a call from the franchise owners and said that the first deal had fallen through. Would they like the franchise? Absolutely. Amazingly, I think, I don't have the dates down exactly, but maybe two weeks before closing, they had a supernatural, unusual, sudden profit transaction come into their business that produced the millions of dollars necessary to buy the franchise in one transaction. In other words, they had some deals happen that in that one week produced the millions of dollars necessary to close on that transaction. They bought it, they had it appraised, it was appraised for twice the millions that they paid for it. Yeah. Friend, God gives seed to the sower, bread for eating, and the Bible says he'll increase your store of seed. Why does he want you to have more seed? Because he is in the people business. You're his ambassador. He wants you to act like he does. He wants you to be generous on every occasion because it opens people's hearts. They can see God's heart. It says they will thank God for your Grace, the amazing supernatural grace, God's empowering you to prosper. 
Paul says this, thank God for this indescribable gift. What was the gift? I asked you first, it's the grace of God to prosper. Thank God for this gift, this power of God that comes alongside you to cause you and help you to prosper. And I'll tell you what, it's changed a lot of lives in this room. It's changed Drenda, our life completely. But if you understand this process, you don't have to look any further for the opportunity of a lifetime because you have it right now. God, God who made all things is offering you the opportunity to work with him in the earth realm to create wealth for his people business. It's your choice. Hi, I'm Gary Cassie. And I'm Drenda Cassie. We're so glad you joined us. Wow, it's such a great day to be alive and be free. You know, I love doing this. We, do we just love sharing the kingdom because that's what changed our lives. Yes, it changes lives. It changes our life as we Absolutely. share it. Yes. It just gets more exciting. It and is. there's joy in that, right? It is right? so exciting. It, I have exactly. a story here, Gary, just a real quick. Steve yeah. says, hi, Gary. Just wanted to let you know that when you talk about coming into agreement with your ministry, sowing and receiving, it made my life much better. I don't worry about my money anymore because when I sow, I know that I will receive. Thanks for all that you and Drenda do. Steve. Awesome. Awesome. That's well, why that's we do true. this. It's fun. Fear is not part of the kingdom. No, it's not. The laws of the kingdom give us assurance and confidence that it's going to work every time. Mm -hmm. And that's what we try to help yes. people understand. You know, Gary, you just wrote a book, Your Financial Revolution, mm -hmm. The Power of Generosity. And this you know, is every the fifth. Yeah, a fifth. Wow. The fifth installment. In yes. The series. Yes. Yeah, fifth. And it's excellent. I can't yeah. wait even till we release the whole set. But uh, I, I know, Gary, everyone wants success. You don't meet anyone that says, I want to fail in no. life, but there are keys, especially to do it God's way. The world's definition of success doesn't really turn out to be success. And we've no. talked about that, but God's way brings blessing in every area. You're reading the scripture in 2 Corinthians 9 and another program about he'll make you rich on every, in every exactly. way so you can be mm -hmm. generous on every generous. occasion. So what is the key to success? Uh, it, it, How do we succeed God's way? There are many keys. All right, as you said, you can pursue it yourself and hit crash and burn by your life being out of balance. But God has a, a strategy of success, principles you can follow that will, uh, let me say it this way. I said this throughout this series that you have a choice. You can pursue your own success or you can pursue God's success and handle his money and your money. And, you know, having God on the team is pretty powerful because Absolutely. he knows quite a bit. Yes. He can help you get there. But specifically today, uh, I want to talk about a parable. In my mind, in my, in my experience, this is the toughest parable. This parable lays it out so clear, but yet so, uh, <laughs> it makes you stop and think. It's profound. It's profound. That's the word I'm looking for. But this it also has accountability for all It has accountability. <laughs> But it is, it lays out I, one of the greatest keys to success in life. And it's the parable of the shrewd manager. Now, yeah, I'm let me sure just... you're going to put another, uh, you <laughs> yeah. have such revelation on how these parables. These really, parables are written what to they teach us kingdom law and kingdom principles. And this one is, every time I read it, it just makes me think. So let's talk about it. The parable of the shrewd managers in Luke chapter 16, and to set the stage, this owner of a company, so to speak, fires his manager because he has been dishonest with the owner's money. He's been wasting it. Mm -hmm. And so as this guy prepares to leave the company, he goes to all of the vendors that owe, I mean, I guess people that owe his company money. I guess they're the vendor. People owe his company money he goes to them and say, hey, quickly, you know, here's, here's the bill. I'm going to cut it in half if you pay it right now. Mm. Now, whose money is he stealing? The man, his <laughs> boss's money. It's always <laughs> easy to give the, the boss's. The company owner's money. Yeah, the, the owner's money away. And so he does that through a few th through companies. And so the master hears about this and he confronts him. Mm. And let me read this to you, what he says in verse 8. Uh, he commends the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. Now, the definition of shrewdly is clever awareness 
resourcefulness, especially in practical manners. In other words, this guy had the ability to put together a plan of, of advancing himself, but he had not, he had not and had never demonstrated that on behalf of the master's business. He was all about himself. So it wasn't that he lacked the ability no, or didn't right. have the capacity. He didn't care. He, he didn't, cared about himself and not about his boss. He care. He or the was business. about himself. Hmm. Let me just say it as plain as it can be. He was a hireling. Hmm. Okay. Now, he, the master goes on and talks, and then Jesus gives us some insights uh, in this parable that are profound. I mean, like you said, profound. Whoever can be trusted with little can be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with little will be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, note that, worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Mm. Let's talk about this. This is, this is a major wow, that's key. that's loaded. There's a lot there. There's a lot there. You have to pass the trust test with worldly things first. Hmm. David was trustworthy with a trust concerning sheep. Right? Sheep. Sure. Right. He risked his life to protect the sheep. His dad's okay? sheep. <laughs> his dad's sheep. You, you have to pass the loyalty test on worldly things. Now, we have people running around. Where's the anointing? I want to serve God. But they miss the whole point. They're trying to jump ahead and try to promote things, make things happen. That's not how God operates. See, God knows where you're at. He knew where David was. Sure. He knew his name. He knew what he was doing. He had been given a trust. In his era of time, that wasn't a very esteemed position to be a shepherd. No, it wasn't. Even so much so that his dad didn't even call him in Never, mm -mm. when the prophet came to That's right. see which one could be the king. That's exactly right. But David passed the loyalty test willing to risk his life for the sheep, or I mean it this way, risk his life on behalf of the assignment. That's good. What would it cost him? Everything. Mm -hmm. Could have cost him everything. Sure. All right? So you have to be trustworthy with the worldly assignments and trust first to qualify for God's assignments. Which are the true riches. The true riches, but that's the assignment where you get to handle God's money. And notice, this guy was disqualified. Hmm. If he was disqualified, there must be a way he could become qualified. Right? Right. So he was disqualified because he was wasting the resources. He had no care about the master. Hmm. He is a hireling. He's there for one purpose, that's himself. The master commends him for that because, oh, gee, guess you, you have the ability to produce all kinds of strategies for gain and profit, but only for you mm. because you're a hireling. All right. Now, well, now we, we go a step further, and it gets a little more intense with this parable, <laughs> okay? So Jesus defines a hireling in John chapter 10 as someone who runs when the, the wolf comes or the bear comes. It says, because they do not care for the sheep. They're a hireling. Now, this guy, he was a hireling. Self-preservation was more important yeah. to him than the assignment or anything else. Exactly. Now, let me ask you this. This is a tough question, okay? Christians uh -oh. <laughs> typically, typically give what's left over. Sure. When it comes time to give, hey, it's time to give. Let's support this cause. Let's support this uh, assignment. You know, God's, we're, we're doing this. They look at their budgets and they come up with what can we afford Right. What can we do? And again, there's no condemnation in this. I'm just giving a principle here. What can I afford? And they'll give, you know, whatever it is. But they'll go out the same day and buy a brand new car, a brand new boat, whatever it is. Same thing with time. Time, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But they give God the leftovers. Mm -hmm. So I need to ask a question. Do you qualify to handle God's money? Are, and this is the tough question. Are you a Christian hireling? Mm -hmm. Do you care more about your stuff than God's stuff. How do we know this, Gary? How do we test Well, because we can test, you know, first off, you can give me your checkbook, I'll tell you in two seconds, mm -hmm. okay? But are you a Christian hireling or are you on board in the family business, the people business? Now, let's understand this. This guy was disqualified because he didn't handle the money on behalf of the master. But if God finds someone who is trustworthy, guess what he's gonna do? He's gonna 
promote that person. He's going to give them true riches. Big assignments, yes, bigger big things. ideas. Yes. He's going to give him the multi-million dollar idea. He's going to give him the business concept, right? Right. And that guy's going to prosper big time. But this is a tough question. As you read this, this guy was a hireling. He's, do I really care about funding God's assignments? Hmm. Am I a Christian hireling? And what did Jesus say when he actually laid this parable, this parable out? How did he present this to well, the disciples? Well, he said it pretty clearly. If you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Wow, that speaks so much, Gary, because through the years we've talked to people who they want to own a home, uh, they want to have their own business, or they want to have their own ministry, and they haven't been uh, willing to do what needed to be done to take yes. care of somebody else's. Uh, we've seen people do so many things that had lacked integrity, lacked character. Yes. And, you know, talent, they always say, can take you somewhere your character can't keep you. And it's true, when we've seen this play out, and it's just a matter of time, you feel kind of like that sick feeling in your stomach for mm -hmm. them because you know, oh, no, hey, you know, they're making a decision that in the, in the long run they think is going to advance yep, them, yep, but, but it's actually going to mm -hmm. set them way back. But everyone has to pass this test. Everyone mm -hmm. must pass it. In fact, Jesus said no one can serve two masters. Either he's going to hate the one, love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, that, that's wonderful because what it's saying is I have a choice. Right. And if I want to serve God and I am all for God and I'm, I'm going to be count me in on the team, Wow, I have a wonderful future. But I love what you teach because just like Steve said, because he's learned how to engage the kingdom of God, sowing and reaping, now exactly. he can trust God's taking care of his money. And you know, people sometimes say, well, why do you talk about money? Because we don't want people to worship money. We don't exactly. want people to run after money, to love God instead. But when you don't know how to meet your needs, it's very easy for people to worry about money. And so when you teach them, you teach so well, and you're a, rev you're a revolution, you're a financial revolution, you help people understand the principles that God put in place to take care of their provision so they don't exactly. have to run after the things of life. That's they right. don't have to run after money That's and get right. their seek priorities first the messed kingdom up. Of God. Mm -hmm. It didn't say seek first God. It says mm -hmm. seek first the kingdom, the operation, the laws of the kingdom. Do things according to God's laws because he already gave you the entire kingdom. Okay. But if you begin to apply the laws of the kingdom, learn You're how to operate. You're not talking about Old Testament laws. You're talking no, about this principles. Is, this, is, this is out principles. of Matthew. Seek first the kingdom right. of God, and all these things will be added to you because you already have them. But learning how to appropriate them through the kingdom, the laws of the kingdom, is essential. So when we come right back, we're going to talk more about this because this is vital to your success. Yes. And we're going to come yes. right back with some great stories. Yeah. And we have a great, a great story, story yeah, too. Great yeah, story. it's going to be so awesome. We'll be right back. No matter how long you've been a Christian, you probably still have questions about God and His kingdom. Because you asked, Faith is a mentorship CD that answers your specific questions about faith. Understand the will and character of God. Know how to determine if you're truly in faith. And learn exactly how the kingdom of God operates. Head to our website, garycassie.tv, so we can send you this important audio teaching. We're talking about promotion God's way. That's the best way. It's also much bigger than you can manufacture yourself, right? Right. And the principles uh, to qualify, to qualify, to catch God's attention, to give you a trust, to give you access to his assignments, which are big, big assignments. Mm -hmm. So it's good. And I want to make another point here because uh, you might remember King Saul. King Saul in 1 Samuel 15 uh, he was disqualified. We talk about the uh, manager being disqualified. Saul, the king himself, was disqualified. Remember, he built an idol to himself, a statue to himself. He's all about himself, and he was disqualified to the point that God even said, I regret, this is in verse 10 of that chapter, I regret that I have made Saul king because he's turned away from me and not carried out my instructions. Wow, I wouldn't want to be that person that God regretted putting in a position. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't want to be Saul either because it wasn't good. But here's what happened. The Lord found another king, David. But I want you to listen to what he said about David. Why did he pick David? 
uh, it says this, after removing Saul, this is Acts 13, 22, after removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning David. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Now, in Christian circles, I love God. I love God. I love God with my heart. But what does God say? Right. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Yes. David was called to being a king because God could trust him to do Yes. What he said to do. That's good, Gary. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yes. do not do the things I say? Exactly. So we qualify so our actions for the next assignment. Of course, we have that story. You might yes. tell us this great story coming uh, Brad up. Brad and Charity, a phenomenal couple. They went from $200 left. That's all they had. And God, because of their heart, just like King David, they were able to produce a phenomenal six-figure income and business that continues to grow. Take a look at their story. I started the business after desiring to have products for wavy hair. But uh, at the time, I wasn't making the products to sell. I just was passionate about black hair. And so I started giving my friends recipes on how to mix their own products. And one day a friend of mine came to me and said, why don't you do that work? Make the products and sell to us. And so I started making natural products. I started praying, what do I call the business? And what I heard was Uhuru. Uhuru is a Swahili name that means freedom. I just said, yeah, I'll call it Uhuru Naturals. God said that the reason he told me to call it Uhuru Freedom is because he would give us financial freedom through the business. So that really blessed me. But the biggest thing that happened is at the women's conference, because I would say we made $350. We paid $150 for the table and $200 we felt like we needed to sow it as first fruit. And so we went to Pastor Gary, he prayed over the seed, we told him we want a business. What really took us to the next level, uh, early in 2017, after we sold some products, started to grow a little bit, one of her suppliers called from California. He was an ostrich farmer, and he was wanting to sell his ostrich oil company, and he wanted to know if we wanted to buy it. Uh, but we had already promised each other we would not take a loan out for anything, and he wanted $40,000, and he, he didn't want to finance it. Something told me that it could be done. I didn't know how, but I knew it could be done. So I approached Brad with a positive attitude that we can do this. So I said, okay, let's go to California. He said, let's get tickets, because he wanted us to go and see the, the company. I guess the closer we got to the ostrich farm, the more nervous I got, because I'm asking the Lord, now what do I tell this guy about how we're gonna purchase this ostrich oil company when I, don't, I had the money for the plane ticket, but I didn't have the money to buy the company. They showed us around, and then they told us that they had another buyer. So the circumstances weren't lining up with, uh, you know, with us purchasing this ostrich oil company. Before I left, he said, I am the president of the American Ostrich Oil Association, and I want, I need an IT person. He, I told him that I was worked in IT, and he said, I need someone to work my webinar. I, would you meet me in Dallas? And so I said, sure. He said he would pay for the flight, he would take care of everything, and, um, I brought Charity with me and we actually helped him out. So we built a relationship with him. He said, we, we meet a lot of people, but there was just something about you guys. We feel like we're gonna have a long-term relationship with you. And we, you know, we're gonna tell those other people we found a buyer and that it's no longer for sale to them. He was willing to sell it to us. And then he asked me, how soon do you think you can get me the money? <laughs> and I was like, very nervous again. And I, and I, I turned to Charity, she says, just tell him a couple weeks. And so I said, well, we think we can come up with the money in a couple weeks. Before we knew it, the couple accepted to take payments for the business, for, for the, and they sold us the ostrich oil company. We paid it off, actually, uh, last year. I remember telling Brad, today I got it. I got what the pastor is saying. He's not asking us to give from our paycheck. He's asking us to partner with God so that God will give us the money so that we can fund his kingdom. I said, and Brad, if he's going to give us that figure, he's not gonna leave us broke. He's gonna leave us with some money. He said, okay, let's do it. Between April and August, things were just 
No, more, nothing was really moving fast. But something happened in August that forever changed our lives. I found a product from Chad in Africa for natural black hair. So when I found this product, I was able to formulate other products using the ostrich oil company, the, the ostrich oil that I had just bought. So I'd mix with this product from Chad and we made the perfect product for black hair. By November, the sales had really started picking up. I saw on Etsy, eBay, Amazon, and our own website. And so this year, one year later, we were able to finish the goal that was meant we had thought would pay it off in three years, but we yes, just we got done. half the time. It has to be supernatural because we're in a small suburb in central Ohio, and we're selling ostrich oil and shaving powder all over the world. We are speechless. We yeah. like the, we, we remember a scripture in the Bible in the Old Testament that says we are like those who dreamed okay. a dream. Yeah. And we certainly are like those who dreamed a dream. We went from a shoe rack and a bucket of shea butter and starting our, launching our business in the women's conference at Faith Life Church yeah. to paying off our journey yeah. in half the time. And only God could do that. Only God. We're just in awe of what yeah. He could do. It's not like we had all the money first. I mean, it's easy to set a goal when you already have the money. <laughs> but uh, when it's completely impossible and you're shocked to even write it down on a piece of paper and you see it happen, there's nothing like it. There's just nothing like it. I mean, really, if it can happen for me, it can happen for anyone. What a great story. You can see the generosity in Brad and Charity's heart to want to give. They wanted to build a business to give. And that was our motivation to start a business as well. And it's the same principle and many more that Gary's covering in the power of generosity. They wanted to be generous yes. and God gave them the ideas exactly. and he promoted and gave them the finances to purchase the business. And yeah, do what he they gave did. them the, I call it divine appointments, mm -hmm. the intersection of favor and people. God orchestrated their steps because their heart, as you said, Drenda, their heart was, they're giving to give. Mm -hmm. Their heart is for the kingdom. And they knew that if they set themselves in that posture, you remember what she said? God is not going to leave us with no money. Yes. <laughs> God is going to bless us. And they have just had phenomenal, phenomenal success. And it just keeps growing and growing mm. and growing. I like and the scripture. This is how it works. Yeah, I'm thinking of the scripture. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. Yes. We had that on our refrigerator and mirror for years. Mm -hmm. And it's true. We make the Lord mindful of us when our heart is His heart and we're in the family business and we care about what God cares about. Uh, he loves all the kids, but. You know, you do, yes, yes, you do yes. put yourself in a position that God is mindful of you yes. because of your generosity. Yeah, I have a series on that. It's called, Are You One of God's Favorites? Mm. Because God loves all of his kids, but even parents know which kid to give the assignment to knowing it'll get done, mm. right? right? So God, you know, he's looking, who can I give this assignment to? Because he wants it done. Mm. That's why Saul was disqualified. That's why David was promoted. And that's why you'll be promoted as well as you put God first and you take part in God's business. He's going to make sure that you get the ideas, the download from heaven, the direction, the divine appointment. Mm -hmm. He's going to make sure that he works with you yes. and helps you in promotion. And Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you. That's right. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. That's the words of our Lord. Sometimes people say, well, you shouldn't give to get. Well, your heart motivation is not, I'm just trying to get something for myself, but it is perfectly right. Jesus put that promise out Absolutely. there that we give and it's given back to us because he wanted you and I to be able to trust him for our provision and not to run after money, not to worry, but to be able to completely have a heart for God, his kingdom, and then he would take care of all those things, just like uh, Steve was saying earlier in the that's testimony. That's right, and that's the key. That's the key to life. It is. And that's your key as well, to follow the word. Put God first and go back and review that parable, Luke 16, and get the book. It's gonna help you. It's gonna teach you a lot about how to step into that posture enable God to bless you. We'll see you next time right here.